about my parents, I can't say I miss them. That's my, my opinion. Missing is, maybe I will see them. To see somebody who loved you, somebody who cared for you, was nowhere to be found. To me, it was like, there was nowhere to go in my life. Just stopped there. There is a, this mass grave at the common. I saw it, my mom is there for sure, because she died there. But my dad, he was killed outside the camp or dumped in the river. I don't know. So there is no way to establish the circumstances or the whereabouts of my dad, which is, which is also painful. So I can say I lost them. I always remember them. I don't know how to explain missing. So there was nothing left. No, not a fork or knife on the floor, nothing. Everything was gone. The killers not only demolished, they killed the people, took away people's lives, but also anything that could remind the people of people, especially photos. They demolished and destroyed the photos and photos as well. So this is why um, collection of things like this, even though you know it's not that um, from first hand, but is almost replacement of what you used to know, what you used to have. Well, I would say that uh, what happened in 1994 was uh, a culmination of episodic killings that took place since 1959. There were killings that happened in 1967, 71, 72, 73 when I was 10, when the village being massacred again. Our parents were always ready to jump over the gates and to jump and go and hide and, and, and sleep outside. I'm a right person to ask because I survived from Genocide happened in 1994. Uh, this genocide last 100 days were about 1 million of Tutsis were killed by the Hutus who were on power and they were majority. But when the plan of our president, Habiyari Mano, was crushed on 6, that's where the open genocide began. You know, somehow it turned, the country turned dark. And the sky became really grey. I started seeing so much um, screaming around, houses being burned. And the whole night, it was the same. Before the, the genocide, when Tutsis fled from their own homes and they managed to get to church, they won't be killed. But the, the rest of the population respected that holy place. In genocide, that didn't make a difference. When I tried to go out, I could see dead bodies. Those people, neighbors that I knew, were lying on the ground and neighbors were being killed, neighbors' houses being burned. Um, I was just surviving on a daily basis and we all just know, we knew, we all knew that any time be me. I was supposed to have died, many people lost their lives. He came and he said, you are next. You're the only people left in, within that area. I saw a crowd of people coming towards my house. They came shouting my name. Men, strong men of them. They came banging that door. I went till I arrived in a simple cathedral in the church. And the statistics says today, when, when they talk about people who were in that church, 
we were 1,500 people. Many people thought, you know, if we can make it to church, we'll be safe. They were used to that. But actually, that was a big mistake because th they collected themselves, which made it easier. We didn't have anywhere to run to. We waited to die. In the morning, we had people around us searching with the dogs. They found us there. So they took us where it was like a park. They told men to take the clothes off. All men did the same, including our cousin, which is my brother. They told them to lie down on their stomach. They choked them. Afterwards, they ask us, are you happy? I can say this is a one of things which helped me to survive. I went to hide somewhere, hide to, uh, to the house of my friend. When I was hiding there, I went with my radio. Because I didn't know that this genocide was gonna take this long, that's why I could keep my radio off and turn my radio on when it's time for the news. So I decided to take radio, just maybe I will listen and have information who has died or how the situation is. On that time, the only communication you had is radio. This battery is something I've been with, with it. It's something which I can't forget because it's something touchable to me. Always when I'm talking to my journey in genocide, there is something comes quick. Pascal comes quick. My radio comes quick. And uh, when I think my mom, the rosary comes straight. Objective is something comes straight to my mind when I'm thinking about my journey or my mommy's or daddy's journey. It's called Chansey. Something they used to do storing milk, milk storage. So um, this is very significant because cow and milk means a lot in the Rwandan culture. Um, I remember people used to come from all over the place just to come and drink milk at home because apparently my mum really knew how to take care of milk and, and also my dad loved milk. But this, the, I think this connects me more to my dad. Basically, there will have to be milk every single day, every single time. In a meal time, there had to be milk for him. My dad, he was a local businessman, he owned a, a shop. One of the things he used to sell clothes for ladies and, you know, and the women, the garments. There was some uh, auction or some uh, sort of car boot sales. I saw a machine exactly. I took to my dad say, oh, that's like my dad's machine. But I can see it's, it's, it's not used, but it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just exactly the same. So it's just an appreciation of my dad. You know, my mom went to the church to hide there. My dad knew, thought that they may not meet again. This was the only blessing my dad could give mom. He said, take this the Bible, take it where, wherever you go. It's the only object that I have which exists before genocide. It's the only one. Why grow up? We had things, we had life. We went back the way we used to live. There was nothing, nothing left of apart from was the only a dog and a big 
plant of roses. The spider didn't want anything to remind me where I have been or anything to take me back. If there's flower still there, that would be my objects. If I, the reason why I mention my flower, I love flowers so much and I need to look after our flowers. So, it reminds me the job I used to do. It reminds me the attachment I used to have. But it's too late because I didn't know it would be viable things to carry. Because by that time, everything to me was useless. If I can't find anything below to my mother, that would be a winning a million pounds. Behind every successful man, there's always a strong woman. My mom was relentless as well, and also helping for in the shop and so on, and also by raising us as well. She would tell us stories, especially bedtime stories, that at an early young age we need to hear about the hyena, you know, about the the, the cunning, you know, the urukwavu, you know, the hair, yeah, hair. You still remember, we very fond of these stories. But you keep them in your heart, you just remember them internally. This is my brother. His name is Joseph Gattare. He was a very quiet guy, but a very generous man. He used to look after me because he used to call me my little sister, my mother, my friend, my everything. So she would do everything in terms of my education. I miss my mother. This is my dad. And he was killed together with my young brother and niece. If I visit my friends, I'll find a picture and then I will beg to have it. So I found his pictures. Actually, I brought them here in England, took them in the studio. They put them together in one picture. Dan was the youngest boy, and uh, he will imitate my dad, how my dad talks, how my dad do things. We used to love always uh, when I remember him, for me to remember them. It means everything to me because they are, they are friends who lost their beloved one and they don't have any picture of them. They are on my profiles, with WhatsApp profiles, family profiles. These pictures everywhere. That's my mom. That's my dad. I've got a picture here as well when he was trying to find my mommy's body. People who killed them were still in the prison. Then when they come back from the prison, we managed to talk to them and uh, they agree to take us where they put them, where they put them. This is the way they put them. So we take them back from there. So we invite the people, we invite the friends, relative for, for the official funeral, for the official burial. So this is my dad. He used to smile and laugh. And all he used to do is just pick up that cup of milk and drink it and just go. This picture was the only thing that we found from the old belongings that we had. And um, I actually had to edit it. Um, it was old and was you know, scratched and there was no life to it and I, I was worried that we are going to lose it. For 15 years, I was quiet. I didn't want anybody to know about me. One day to people, people to, to understand our struggle, how to cope with whether that we have this uh, background 
of this uh, um, package that we, we carry on that of losing the most precious people, that reality of the past is still with us. This is this emptiness. Remembrance, uh, I think we have the big duty to use this time to remember, just to raise awareness to the international community. For me, opening up to tell people what happened, there is no any other benefit rather than making awareness how bad this experience is so that it's not happening again. Our families, our, our country lost a million people. It's, it's everyday remembrance. To remember or to continue to reminding everyone your duty to make peace, your duty to respect human being, it's your duty to do so. Because if we don't do it, who is going to do it?